Before we start the presentation, I want to welcome everybody to German because there's a lot of people from out of town coming to the presentation. And this is a monthly series that we're starting with speakers every month on different topics. And uh, they've been very well uh, attended, but this is so far the big, the largest attendance we've had. Mm -hmm. And we have the gymnasium that we would like to expand and use that, and put seats in there, and have the presentations on the stage. So. As this progresses and gets better, uh, hopefully we'll have a, a, the attendance where we can move this into the gym. And I just want to welcome everybody to German. And on the open house, if you're not aware of it from out of town, uh, it's a collection of everything that we can find on the history of German. We have albums and albums and albums full of articles, pictures, uh, history of, of uh, the lineage of people's families. Uh, we have artifacts of different buildings and businesses that were in town. We have milk bottles from the dairy. We have uh, things from a, a, a lumber yard. We have uh, things from different stores in town. There's quite a bit of stuff that we display and Walter uh, is very good about getting it out. So if you if you hear about the open house, that's what it is. And we fill that whole gymnasium with artifacts, articles, books, so that you can come and research. So it's a, it's a very good time you get a chance to come over, it probably will be in September or October. All right, and at that being said, uh, I guess our presentation is going to be on the Indians, American Indians. And uh, I don't, do you, Dale, do you want to do an introduction? Dale Keklak is the one who brought our, uh, our speakers for us for this month. It's Spirit Shadow Echo. Shadow Spirit Agro, Mountain Wolf's grandmother to the Northeastern Timberland Nation. This is my warrior, River Wild. He accompanies me to every place I go. It is his duty to be with me, to protect me, guide me, and keep me safe everywhere I go. I shut the air off, that's all. Why does those get a little warm? Why is the podium there? It's a You'll be able to hear it. I'm going to start over. <laughs> Wishta, which is greetings in the native tongue. I am Shadow Spirit Echo, Mountain Wolf Clan Mother to the Northeastern Timberland Nation. This is my warrior, River Wild. He accompanies me everywhere I go, for it is his job to protect me, keep me safe, that, you know, no harm to come upon me among many other duties that he has to the village. Now, some of you were up in Archibald when I gave my first presentation, well, my presentation there. This is going to be a little different because German's not on the map, okay? So I'm going to go in order here, and I'm going to start with my, um, my family history. Yeah, to help you better understand what I'm going to present to you. I am an identical twin, born in Scranton, and raised in Madisonville, three miles outside of Moscow. I stand before you as a blonde-haired, blue-eyed native. My father told me I am a descendant of Native American, Indian, and slave. Many generations ago, my family bloodline tried to purge the Native American out of our lives. I was not allowed to date a man with brown eyes or black hair. His skin color had to be the same as mine. If I dated a man with black hair and brown eyes, I would be disowned. I was raised on a 97 and a half acre farm in Madisonville. We were the only farm on this property. Our farm was the last of its kind. It was called a horseshoe farm, for the barn construction was like that of a horseshoe. The barn has been torn down. The barn in our home was put together with wooden nails. My parents loved the country along with the wilderness. My mother was Shoshone and Dutch German. My father was Blackfoot and German. There is no difference between Blackfoot and Blackfeet. Only Blackfeet is federal, federally recognized. I am a farmer's daughter. My father was a veteran, a 33 degree mason, as well as a member of the Sons of the Pioneers. I am blessed with having known 
five grandmothers, two regular, two great, and one great-great-grandmothers. I believe it was my fourth or fifth grandfather who was Shoshone. He prophesied that every third generation twins would be born. To make a living, he made jewelry. For the next set of twins, my sister and I, he made a copper turquoise baby bracelet, ring, and necklace. My home burnt down by arson. I lost everything. We lived off our farm, and on this land is many places where Native Americans lived. Because our farm was so large, we didn't own bikes. We owned horses. There are many laneways and pathways which we walk and explored. It truly amazed me about these paths, paths that were used by the Indian and the settler. Deep in the woods is a small campsite with a large boulder, and the large boulder is hollowed out. And beside it, there is four trees, like in a square, like if they had grown up. Those four columns of trees is a grave site. Now, each Native nation has their own way of caring for their dead. Beside this boulder, like I said, is a square of trees. Now, the Native would wrap their dead up in their pelts and put them high up and leave them there for a year. A Native will never stay by a Native grave. They move away, for they feel that the spirit lives four days at the grave. And if you go to the grave... You will have a bad spirit that will follow with you. Bad because it's no longer human. It's evil. And it wants to be human. Now, deeper into my father's farm, all the way back is a three-acre field, and there's four columns of rocks. Very odd. So Dr. Joseph and Talisano and I went for a walk, and he said that the rocks were a directional point for the Native American as well as the pioneer. I seen a little mound by a tree, and it had some stones that were placed like in a circle, windblown, what have you. He told me it was a baby. Well, I tobaccoed, I prayed. And I left. As a child, I found many treasures there. Arrowheads, <coughs> spearheads, stone axes, and pirates. Fool's gold. Which? This came off my father's property. This is pyrite. It is not gold. It's called fool's gold. When I was a child, I was rich. Now, in the 1600s and the 1800s, Pennsylvania was rich in soil, trees, wildlife, and rivers. Some wildlife, as well as plants and trees, are extinct, or so I have been told. Now, my father's property was told there's a panther crossing there. When my mother was in the hospital with cancer, the doctor called at 11 p.m. and needed to speak to my father. My father and my brothers were bailing hay, trying to get done before the rain. They were way back. I saddled up my horse, proceeded down the laneway. My horse started to act frightened. He snorted and picked up his pace. It was a bright night, and you could see very well. I heard a god-awful growl and a very large hiss. I quickly looked, and on the stone wall was a panther. I don't think my horse's feet touched the ground. He was in a full run. When I got to the three-acre field, I had gave my father the message from the doctor, then informed him of the panther. My father was very angry with me and told me that I should have known better, for it was that time of year for the panther crossings. Now, my great-grandmother had serious concerns of the panthers, for they crossed and traveled through Mount Cobb. In Pennsylvania, no county was extinct to native wars, wars between themselves and the settlers. Mount Cobb, the Indian used for smoke signals. 
It is estimated that 20,000 Indians inhabited Pennsylvania during the 1600s to the early 1800s. Every Indian knew when to look up to the sky for smoke signals in Mount Cobb. They would know when to run or stay. Warrior Run is justly named. Many warriors used this path to kill the settlers. Route 590 was a major hunting trail used by the Native American, later the settlers. The Indians would plant orchards. Settlers were squatting in the orchard, which the Native killed the, killed the white men. The orchard was called Little Meadows. Route 590, east of Hamlin, leading from Mount Cot through Hamlin, continuing down Goose Pond Road. That road was made by the Native American. Now, past Lake Gennaro is a farm, and on this land, the Native went to war with the settlers. All the Natives were killed. To this day, you can see this field as it was on the day of this massacre. Forgive me, because some words here are just like, whew. It was called the Paoli Massacre. Thousands of Indians were killed or sold into slavery. In 1780, slavery was abolished, but there were indentured servants. Native Americans were not allowed to own or possess property, so they married white people so they could own property. My great-grandmother traveled here to Pennsylvania in a Conestoga wagon. Her great-grandmother, at age 13, ran away and married a Shoshone native. She was disowned. Native Americans at this time could not read or write. They wore skins, pelts of all kind. I asked my grandmother, why are Indians called savages? She said, they dress like animals and live like animals. I didn't want to hear no more, so that was the end of that conversation. All true Native Americans tell stories to be handed down from one generation to the next and so on. One particular story my grandmother, Freema Taylor, Haven Strike Noly, told was a time in her childhood when she lived in Taylor. Her brother Jimmy went to the mercantile to pick up a few things. My grandmother was raised in a cabin in Taylor. I stated earlier, all of Pennsylvania was a forest. When Uncle Jimmy started for home, he saw a mountain lion, and the mountain lion saw him. He was two miles from home, and that mountain lion followed him all the way to the cabin. For two hours, that mountain lion circled that cabin before disappearing. Jessup Mountain, this, this, this breaks my heart. Jessup Mountain was a very beautiful mountain. It was loaded with trees, beautiful trees. As you're driving through Jessup Mountain, you can see a very winding road, which today is blocked off with boulders and cut trees. This road was known as Snake Mountain because of its winding road. Pioneers and Indians used this road. The road had to be a winding road. If it was straight path, you would lose your wagon, horse, even life. <coughs> Pioneers used the road for travel. Natives used it to kill the settler. For safety's sake, a new road was made and named Jessup Mountain. Take a moment and think about all those trees that once grew there. So much forest forever gone. Thornhurst today looks just like what it did back in the 1700s. You can drive for miles and see nothing but forest. Traveling to a friend's home, I got lost. I called for help, and I was lost. I was told to go so many miles, make a left here, make a right there, and when you come to the totem pole, you'll know where you're at. <laughs> I was shocked. The totem pole was there. I knew where I was at. I don't know how old this totem pole is, or even if it's still there, but I do know that it is used as a road marker in Thornhurst. My great-grandmother Maud Warner Swartz would travel what is now called the Old Elmhurst Boulevard. She lived long enough to bury her six children and husband. To supplement her income, she would hitch up her buckboard and take her produce, egg, cheese, and vegetable to what was called the Wholesale Block on Lackawanna Avenue. Lackawanna Avenue was the first road in Lackawanna. 
It was a dusty dirt road, one side for the train, the other side for the market. From there it flourished. There are 83,000 miles of streams in Pennsylvania. Lackawanna is Lenape, meaning the river that forks. Everywhere there is a river, <coughs> Indians would travel and live. It is said that if you dug two to three hundred feet down in the sediment, you can find native artifacts. In the Roaring Brook in Hollisterville was found a dugout canoe. This canoe can be seen at the Everhart Museum along with many other artifacts. Each tribe is different in caring for their dead. The tribe that lived in Hollisterville wrapped their dead up in their pelts, tied the deceased in their canoe, and held the canoe upright to the tree, tied the canoe to the tree for one year. They moved away. After one year, they came back to the deceased with their horse and dog. They killed the horse and dog and burned everything to ash, then moved on. I am part Shoshone, and Shoshones bury their dead. How do you comfort the living when they have an untimely death of their child? My 15-year-old niece was killed in a car accident. We made a pahakne for her grave. A pahakne is a hoop attached to a wooden pole and placed in the middle of the grave. <coughs> the parent, and only the parents, would hold on to the hoop so the spirit of the child would come through the hoop to the parent's spirit. If anybody other than the parent removes the hoop, there is a curse placed on them until atonement is made. All burial sites are sacred. A mound represents a pregnant woman. From spirit we come to spirit we go. Natives believe that if you leave a footprint in a burial site, a bad spirit will follow. Will follow you until atonement is made. In Archibald, there is a 40-foot <coughs> waterfall. There are many caves there. It is said that one cave has the markings on the wall carved by natives who once thrived there. War broke out again, and many lives were lost. Okay. Now, the British was pretty much a part of Pennsylvania, and they didn't like the native. So the British wanted to pay the Indians to go and kill the white people $1 million, or so the story goes. What happened was the British dressed up like the Native American, took the gold, and killed the Indians. There is no gold. <clears throat> there is also a large mound there. I hear it's very large. I have been told by one young man that just standing outside that mound, he got an eerie feeling. He left with no desire to go back. In Jefferson Township is a small creek. On this small creek, natives would come from the south during the summer and camp there. Further down the stream is a huge, large ledge, and this ledge is way up high. The native would dance in their circle <coughs> because dance is prayer every year. Slowly, they started to disappear. Somewhere in the late 1800s to the early 1900s, the last Indian danced for the last time. This story comes from an 87-year-old woman who told me it was her grandfather who witnessed this Indian. She too was raised on a farm and during planting season when her father plowed up the soil, lots of artifacts were found, which she displays proudly in her home. In Madisonville, there is another farm. While excavating for sand, they found a massive burial site. The government moved in and stopped the excavating. To this day, it still stands. If you go to a very old graveyard, you will see field stones as grave markers. People were poor, for, poor, so they used the field stones as headstones. Large field stones for adults, small for babies and children. A good example to see is Bear Brook Cemetery in Madisonville. We are all told that the Native American died due to wars and disease. This is true. Sometimes I would walk through graveyards just to look and see. I came across the graveyard where way in the back of the graveyard was buried many babies. They all died within three years. I had to find out why so many babies died so close together. What I was told shocked me. 
In the early 1800s, Pennsylvania had what was called the Black Plague. All I could think of was here in the day. In Pennsylvania, there are six federal nations, Iroquois, Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Mohawk, and Tuscarora. Now, the uh, Algonquin Indian was subservient to the Iroquois. Out of the Algonquin language, you can speak 17 languages. The Algonquin is the Indian who brought peace to the Indians and to the white men because you can speak 17 languages. Native American population is zero here in Germany. Welsh, Irish, and German settled here in the beginning. It is recorded that there were no Indians in Germany. Statistics are wrong. The British killed the Indian and the settlers bought natives as slaves. I was told that the Indians were caught, killed, oh yeah, this newspaper article where um, that they would capture the Indian, kill him and hang him upside down on the mercantile steps, cut them up for dog food. So anybody who needed dog food would go and get a piece of the Indian to feed his dog. And when the, that Indian was gone, they got another one. The silent history of German has captivated me, for we have had some very famous pioneers that traveled through here. Chapman Lake is a man-made lake. The relative to Chapman who made Chapman Lake is John Chapman, better known as Johnny Appleseed. The Native American loved Johnny Appleseed for they planted orchards too. Now Johnny Appleseed's orchards were very bitter apples. Apples made vinegar and whiskey. Johnny Appleseed was also a preacher as well as well and preached to the native. There are many streams and brooks flowing through Germany. Natives were fur trappers as well as the pioneers. Daniel Boone traveled through here, through German. No different. Daniel Boone was captured by the Shawnee and left for dead. He didn't die. He came back with a vengeance on the Indian and killed everyone who was native at that very chance he had. He led a group of settlers to Kentucky, where Abraham Lincoln's grandparents were among the settlers. Christopher Houston better known as Kit Carson, was a trapper, among many things. Briefly blew through German. He loved the native and had two native wives. He was an explorer, too. One more, Davy Crockett. He blew through here, too. You know, whether it was one day or two days, we, you got a famous name like this, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, they're going to remember. Oh, yeah, my great-grandmother remembered when Billy the Kid was killed. Because she was across the street. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so find an elderly person and ask them to give you stories about their little town called German. It will fascinate you. In 1969, all Native Americans were declared U.S. citizens. <clears throat> I'm going to describe some things. When the Native American was caught and taken to holding places to be sent to their reservations, <coughs> the white man did not like the leather animal. The Indian said, can we have lace? To the Native, the fringe is the lace. The white man said, no. Well, they got together and they said, can we have ribbons? White man said, okay. This is a Cherokee traditional ribbon shirt. Here are his colors. He is Cherokee and Apache. 
Oh. You know your brother by his colors. You know your sister. You know your families by their colors. <coughs> Women had to have more than a shirt, so this is a Cherokee original. It's called a tear dress or a tear dress. <coughs> it's off of the Trail of Tears. They were allowed to make this. They were not allowed scissors, knives, or nothing. They had to tear the material. <coughs> this is, I am Shoshone. I claim Shoshone. My colors are black, blue, and red. This dress is, like I said, is an 18th century pattern. Women who sew, it, right here in the armpit, it's a V, unlike how we just sew the sleeve in. No, they cut a V to put in there, kind of like, you know. Everything was torn, and the ribbons were put on, and the women knew who was their sister, clan mother, whoever. Cherokee tear dress. Now, I don't know if you've been to powwows, every woman carries a blanket. The problem is, is some of our natives today don't even know why we carry a blanket. When there was war, the women would go out to retrieve their dead. They took their blankets and they laid it over him. If he was alive, they laid the blanket over him, brought him home, and nursed him back to health. This tricked the white man. <coughs> now, we have little girls, and they like to dance. Blankets are pretty special. We have what is called the fancy shawl dance. Now, the Shinnecock tribe and many other tribes use it for many things. But the little girls would wrap their blanket around them and they would dance. And they would dance all around the circle. That's a fancy shawl dance to represent a butterfly. But that's what our children are, butterflies. They're going to change one day into adults. The women would get very cold in the wintertime, and you know, back in the 18th century, they loved wool. Wool was pretty warm. <coughs> this is called a capote. Some people would think it would be for Santa Claus, for, look at how long that, that thing is there, right? This goes, I don't want to put it on because it really is hot. They would put it on, take the lid, and then roll this around for the winter months. Wow. Today, women don't wear this. This is a capote, and it is a man's capote, and it is handmade. here in Pennsylvania back in the 1700s, 1800s, the natives lived in teepees during the summer. During the winter they made huts. The huts were made of bark, moss, and mud. For the logs, the floor was made of split logs. From 1600 through 1800, their weapons were knife, warhawk, bow and arrow, spear, and axes. Later, the repeating rifle known as the Henry. The United States military used the tomahawk during the Vietnam War black ops. Some weapons women used as gardening tools. Pennsylvania does not recognize the Native American Indian. Yet on top of our capital is a statute of an Iroquois Indian. The last tribe to be recognized as a federal nation 
is the Shinnecock Tribe on Long Island, New York in October 1, 2012. 2012. Pennsylvania Native Americans who lived on the Lackawanna River left, went to Delaware and Canada, and stayed there. They were Lenape. Now, we dance in a circle because life is a circle. This is a man's dance stick or a war hawk. In a circle, there's many different kinds of dances for the men. One such dance is a sneak-up dance. I could torture him and have him come up and show you. <laughs> they would dance, and they'd get down on their feet. And they would sneak up, and woo, if you got touched, you know, it's like tag. You're dead. <laughs> Men have rattles. Women have rattles. Our rattles are made from horns. This is a buffalo horn, western sasista rattle. This is an Apache horn rattle. <clears throat> we rattle to our songs. We rattle to our dances. We rattle to our prayers. As we are cleaning our pelts, you know, we want to clean pelt, but back then, what did they do? They took coral. This is, this is what they used. And they would rub this up and down that high until they got what they wanted. They removed all the hair and rubbed this across, and they got themselves the pelt that they needed. A very important tool for a woman. Tobacco happens to be the very sacred part of our being because we believe it's a gift from Creator. When we pray and say we're not at home and we're scared and we, we smoke cigarettes, so what do you do? Take a pinch of tobacco, throw it on the ground, thank you Creator, and He will open your pathway through your faith. Now, we can always find artifacts underground, in ground, in a cave, up a tree. This is a fossil of a leaf from the 40-foot falls. As you see this fossil, look for other things that might have carvings in it. The native couldn't read or write, and that was really irrelevant because what they had to do was survive. They would mark whatever on a rock to help other people out or themselves. They carried what was called the three sisters, corn, bean, and squash. This is an arrowhead that many years ago I found on the Lackawanna River. I have found so many treasures after a flood. Treasures to me might be trash to somebody else, but I look at it and I think of a time where life had to be so simple. <coughs> this I polished, and this is from the Lackawanna River. Now, we sage, which I gotta find. I, I have a prayer here that for many, many centuries was not allowed to be spoken out loud. I want to make sure I have it right. Okay. When they would take the sage, and they would put cedar in it too, they would smudge, smudge bowl. They would smudge the smoke from their head to their toes. Usually a shaman would do this. As the smoke rises, you would bring the smoke to your head for good thoughts. No anger, jealousy, or hate. This is part of this prayer that has been forbidden by Native Americans to be ever said out loud. All of my tribal elders are dead, and my new grandmothers had said, give up the secrets. So, now we go to the eyes, to see the world around you in a good way, to the throat, speak kindness, kind, 
kindly and in a non-judgmental way. Ears, listen to each other instead of waiting to speak. Heart, feel connected to all human beings in a loving way. Under your feet, this way the dark side of your soul and the world will not follow you in your footsteps. Pray silently, never to be spoken out loud. This ends the smudging prayer. Now, up here, whew, I am a strong believer in prayer ties. All prayer ties are is cedar sage, tobacco, and a cloth, and you tie it. You wind it seven times. You burn it, bury it, or hang it. You have to turn your back and walk away and forget your prayer. Like when God said to uh, um, who was that guy? That the wife turned around and she turned into a pillar of salt. Yeah, her. <laughs> it works the same way here. Say your prayer, turn your back, forget your prayer. If you look back upon the prayer tie, you're telling Creator you don't trust that He will answer your prayer. Native Americans are very spiritual people. Everyone should be. Now, this is a little black leather baggie. That's all it is. But to one clan mother, it happened to have been very special. She had her sage, cedar, and tobacco in this, and she had it hooked to her belt. She took a stroke. She came out of this with flying colors. They laid hers behind her head. Two of the highest honors one person can receive. One, an eagle feather. Two, blue corn. This is a smudge bowl. And we use our feathers to smudge us all over and for the next person. That's how that looks. Cornmeal is very, very important. Every clan mother has them. There's three kinds. Yellow, white, and blue. The yellow represents the woman, and that represents wealth and abundance. White cornmeal represents rebirth into the spirit world. Blue cornmeal is spiritual importance. It represents the eastern rising sun, the beginning of life, wisdom, and understanding. The white buffalo calf woman came from the spirit world and bought blue corn with her to tell her story. Two natives were looking at her, and the one native says, Oh my, she is so beautiful. I gotta touch her. The native went up and touched her, and when he did, he went into a pile of ash. The second Indian said, oh, no, 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 you're pretty bad. I'm going to touch you. She said, don't be afraid, for I come to give you a message. And the message dealt with the coming of the pale prophet, who will be coming from father's son. We look to the east every morning. Before our feet hit the floor, we thank Creator for the gift of life, light, and breath, for it is all a gift. Okay, now I have a few frequent... Did I get everything up there? Oh, no, I didn't. And, and can, uh, many people aren't aware of this. The Native American invented chess, and here is the original chess board. Whoa. You will see the chief, the clan mother, the wolves, the teepees. And if you have somebody who would like to learn how to play chess, come on, we can have a grandmother, a grandfather. We know who's important here. The chief, the clan mothers, right? We want to protect that. Wow. It is 
traditional custom that once you were born, all Native Americans learn a craft. This is mine. And I wear it proudly. This is a deer horn with a knife. Okay. Now, some of our people have gotten up in age and we think, oh, they can't do anything, right? Wrong. <coughs> An 89-year-old man hand-painted this feather. You will see these feathers all through. Some are just run off by machines or what have you. This one is signed. This is an original. And that is what this man does for a living. We use turtle shells for many things. Now the turtle represents the United States. Go back in time and look at the map of the United States, and it is in the shape of a turtle. This is a mossback turtle. My granddaughter's went fishing, and uh, I haven't finished it yet because my butterfly broke. But the turtle is sacred. Some people wear it as a medicine bag. <clears throat> I plan on making a purse. <laughs> These pipes are supposed to be all decorated. I'm not going to decorate mine because I know I have cancer and all of my things are going to go down to my two children. This is an antler and this is just wood wound in leather. Now there are those Indians will hang feathers and beads and tailor make it for themselves. When you were in a peace pipe ceremony it breaks the rules if you ask what is inside that pipe. You are never to question an elder. And if you care not to participate in the peace pipe ceremony, that's all you do and then it's over. And it's always swung over this way to the next person. The drum calls many people. And the drum means many things. My drum is slowly being repaired. This is a prayer drumstick. It's very soft, okay? Because, you know, when you're talking to your creator, that's between you and him, okay? You're not calling anybody in or anything. You're praying by yourself. Here, too, this is a calling one. Because you all hit it so hard, that drum is going to echo calls the people. This is a song. You can dance, you can drum to any song with this stick, and pretty much with this stick, but this stick is very sacred. Women always carry feathers into the circle, all right? Feathers represent our spiritual father our creator. Before we enter into a circle, we hold our feather out like this, and we put our tobacco and our sage. And before we step that line into that circle, we go like this. Step over the circle, and then we let it go. What we're doing is we're thanking creator for the opportunity to assemble, to sing, dance, and pray. We love our animals. And they love us too. Oh, yeah. This is a Navajo wooden flute handmade. <clears throat> this too is a little treasure that I'll put away for my son is a musician. And I will hand this to him one day. But that's what a Navajo wooden flute looks like. Like I said, we love our animals. And they love us. Now, wolves pretty much are the deal with the Indian. After they have served us, they continue to serve us, <clears throat> for there ain't nothing more warmer than a pelt. So we keep them.
runaway dog. I don't have any idea how much I lose weight. I stand. We take feathers of all colors. I'm going to have you. This came from a parrot. The Aztec dancers have many of these feathers, and they should from Mexico. My God, they got enough of those bluebirds down there. Up here, the turkey feather was pretty important because I've never done this, but I'm hoping after hunting season I have the opportunity. The women would take the turkey feathers and they would weave them. Therefore, it would cause them to have a, a blanket, something to put over them in the wintertime. For feathers, everything repels and the heat stays in. Okay, frequent questions asked. No, I do not live in a teepee. I own one, and I camp in one. Why is there fire in a circle? Fire is believed to be the part of the sun. The sun represents the pale prophet. Fire is sacred. The drum calls people together, warns of danger, also used for dance, for creator, and calling of spirits. The circle, called the circle of life, for each one of us are a strand of life. Enter from the east gate because this is where the new world will come. And the pale prophet, the teacher. What is sacred to the natives? Let me through this, but here we go again. Tobacco, satyr, siege, sweet grass. In the Old Testament, it is said, you do not offer up any sweet smelling senses to me anymore. So we burn our sage and our cedar for creator, for creator. How did children who were removed from their parents by the white man know if other children from their nation was with them? Every baby born was sing, sung the song, the lullaby, it was called Little Bear. Every tribe notes this lullaby. Did Native women torture prisoners? Yes, they did. They would tie the prisoner to the wooden stake. They would sharpen wooden lances and stick it into the prisoner. Before his last breath, they would put him on fire. How did the Iroquois husband punish his wife? He would pull out a toenail. How did the Native Americans learn medicine? In 1650, the lost tribes of ancient Israel, after exile of 1290, met up with what I believe to be my <coughs> ancestors. The pale prophet to teach a king and taught the medicine of Mother Earth to the Native American. Native hair. If you touch a native's hair, you're telling everybody you're married to them. Automatically, you touch his hair, you're married. Medicine bags. <laughs> this is my medicine ba bag. It has been smudged in Vietnam blood. My brother was Vietnam. And it will go to, with me in my grave. Nobody is allowed to touch a medicine bag. If you do, the whole bag has to be re-smudged, prayed over, and <coughs> forgiven. Never touch a medicine bag. Wow. The loincloth of a man would tell you what his status is. As a child, it would be here. As a teenager, it would go here. As a man, it would go here. As a holy man, a shaman, it goes below his knees. That's how you tell the status of a man. Not what's behind the loincloth, but how long the loincloth is. <laughs> <laughs> now, our little girls dance in a jingle dress. What is a jingle dress? I don't know if any of you have ever tapped trees for sap. But you see those little silver things that you hammer into the tree for the sap? If a little girl wants a jingle dress, she has to dance a dance every day for 365 days. After 365 days, it is no longer a jingle dress. It is now a medicine dress. 
We like trade blankets. Anything. You would lay, like, let's, let's just say a scarf down, and somebody will, sit and <coughs> somebody will throw a knife down, and you'll say, oh, I like that, and maybe throw in some feathers or a pipe. You never know. Trade ban blankets are still done to this day, and they are done after 9 p.m. When the hatchet is on the ground, run. That's a war. That's a fight coming on between two people. Solutions of a chief. A chief is elected by a clan mother. There's only one way to remove a chief. Rape, theft, and murder. Now the shamans are holy medicine men. They do no work. The last traditional medicine man in Pennsylvania was seen 200 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> they must be roasting up there. Now, before I end my presentation, my journey was to seek a spiritual path that would be personal and pertinent to me, because I'm not getting younger, I'm getting older, and I don't want to be frightened, I want to be happy. I'm going to end my presentation with a very famous Native American prayer. Oh great spirit whose voice I hear in the winds, whose breath gives light, light to all the world, hear me. I need your strength and wisdom. Let me walk in beauty and make my eyes ever behold the red and purple sunset. Make my hands respect the things that you have made, my ears sharp to hear your voice. Make me wise that I may understand the things you have taught my people. Help me to remain calm and strong in the face of all that comes towards me. Let me learn the lessons you have hidden in every leaf and rock. Help me seek our pure thoughts and act with intentions of helping others. Help me find compassion without empathy overwhelming me. I seek strength not to be greater than my brother, but to fight my greatest enemy, myself. Make me always ready to come to you with clean hands and straight eyes. So when life fades as a fading sunset, my spirit may come to you without shame. A uh hole. -huh. Now, I want to say Wanishi, Ashian. Wanishi is thank you. The Shoshone language, one word can tell a whole story. You can have 36 or 136 letters, and that's just the, their sentence. So Ashian is thank you for walking with me. This ends my presentation. Thank you for having us. Not my fault. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? What about Chief Capoose down in the at Memorial Stadium? You know, sir, a lot of what I said is what was said to me. I'm not supposed to know my background because Native Americans were considered African Americans. Where I was raised, I never saw a dark person, ever. So when it comes to chiefs and what have you, I'm not from a reservation. I'm from a mountain. My teachings came from my blood elders, as well as elders who have passed. I can't give you information on this chief or that chief because he didn't live with me. He didn't live, he didn't teach me. We have many great chiefs out there that are absolutely wonder to follow, but I cannot answer that question thus River can. Chief Capoose. 
What is it, Capels Avenue named after him? Oh, yeah. Yes. You know, there is yeah, I can, so... I can, I can give you a little bit of background on that. Um, he was the last Indian chief to live in this valley. He was the chief of the Lene Lenape that were forced into this valley. They came from, they got forced out of by the Delaware. They were part of the Delaware Nation. And they got forced to live in the Scranton. That was where they were sent to get away from the rest of the Indians. And they lived their life here. He was the last chief in this area. And uh, Kapaus Avenue, of course, was named after Chief Kapus. He lived, actually, uh, if you're coming out of Clark Summit through the notch and you come into Scranton, their village was where that stream met the Lackawanna River. That's, that's where that would have been. And what she talked about, Route 590 being the Indian path, um, that's also recorded in Lackawanna history books. And the fires on top of Mount Cobb, that's where Aza Cobb lived. And the fires were there. They were the warning fires. And they, they would let everybody know that somebody was coming, the white men were coming. And that Route 590 is now called the Purdy Town Turnpike, which was uh, named after a guy named Purdy, who was one of the original settlers of that area. And there's a lot of history over in that area because that was the original walkway all the way to the Delaware River to the Susquehanna River. They came up over the Dunmore Mountain, up to Mount Cobb. They traveled right on where 590 is, down Goose Pond Road. Lake Wall and Popak was not there then. There was, there was a bunch of rivers that went out into the Lackawaxen River and then along into the Delaware. And a lot of those, the roads that are, most of the roads that we use are trails that the Indians started. And we end up turning them into uh, wagon trails first and then eventually roads that we use now. Sir. Do you have anyone to carry on for you when you're gone? I have to appoint somebody. You have to appoint somebody. You don't have a, a, a sister, a daughter, or, or a son who can take over? I do, but unfortunately, modern technology is their thing. Uh -huh. Oh, I know. I don't know. I don't know everything. And we just started our village because we have so many people who want to learn their spirituality, their background, what tribe they are, who they are, where they came from, <coughs> how they came here. And like there are so many that I, I just can't help mm -hmm. everything. I, I would direct. <clears throat> Before I die, I will write my death song. Behind my death song will be where my artifacts will go, which I really do want to stay within my bloodline because we were forbidden. I am the first one to step up and step out. You're forbidden from what? From, from uh, we were forbidden to date. Uh, black hair, brown eyes, dark skin. Yeah. You know, that was just unheard of. You don't do that. And my family hated the Indian because, well, they came from a poor background. So in order to own property, the Indian married white. So when the census, I think, I'm not sure, here in, in German was taken in the 1800s, I'm sure there was Indians who married white and they were written down as white. How many of you in this room have got maybe one drop of Indian in you and you've lived in the area all your life? See? Don't tell me there was never no German, no Indians here in Germany. They're still here. So the most important part is find an elder. Talk to them. Listen to their stories. <coughs> then you grab your grandchildren and go sit around a campfire. Tell your grandchildren your stories. I have nine of them. They love it but you've got to make it a vibrant, colorful picture for them to remember. When was that next powwow that you're going to have? Oh. In Williamsport is the Boy Scout Jamboree. <coughs> Standing Bear is a shaman, and uh, I really want to go down and support him. He is supposed to have a very famous speaker come to speak. Now, I don't know if any of you know Lenny Peltier. Yes. 
for the story. Absolutely. Well, the last powwow I was at, I met the man, the federal Indian, that turned him in. I thought he was dead. No. He is a federal AIM police officer. Anything else? Yes, sir. I'm, I'm uh, 88 years old, and I remember a lady by the name of Vera Farley. She was an Indian. There was many of them. I mean, and uh, a beautiful lady, dark skin, and so forth. And there was a lady from Mayfield, married an Indian, <laughs> had a lot of children, and he died. And from what I gather, she could not remarry for one year because uh, if she did, uh, they were they were obligated to. Uh, if she, she didn't marry, they were obligated to uh, educate them. To what? Educate the boys. There's a lot of that going around today. Yeah. Uh, she was the uh, Leo Moskowitz's secretary. Uh, Give me your name. Jennings. Rose Jennings. Rose Jennings. Rose, Rose Jennings. <laughs> Rose Jennings. Mayor, you know yeah. the story behind that? No, but I know who you're talking yeah. about. I'll have to look that up. Rose Jennings. Stephen Jennings. I have a question. If uh, an Indian burial ground is taken over by a white man and used as a white man's cemetery, is there a curse upon people, the family, or what, what is the Indian understanding with that? We have a headstone Indian cemetery up by where we live. There's people who walk in and out all the time. The burial grounds are sacred, whether it's native or not. Now, I would still be careful because to this day it's practice. You bury your dead, one year later, you go back, burn them, get rid of them, and then you go on. So if you go into a, a native grave and you feel something creepy or you feel your hair flipping or something or whatever like that, it's quite simple. Take a piece of tobacco and say, forgive me, creator, I'll put it on the ground. No curse will be on you. Oh, I'm going to carry my pouch. <laughs> I'd like to thank them for their presentation. If there's no more questions, I think they did a great job. <laughs> Again, when we have the gymnasium and we have some fans on and we have to make it a little bit cooler. I didn't expect this many people. We have 50 people here tonight. So very good. Very good turnout and uh, very pleased. And uh, it's, it's an honor for me to have somebody like this here. It's, it really is. I'm nosy. I wanted to learn when I was little. And what started my journey was the prohibition period. I went to my grandparents because I know they went through it. And my grandfather was the first surveyor of Moscow. His name was Cowboy Swartz. <coughs> and uh, when I had asked, it was a school project about the prohibition. Uh, he, he was pissed, okay, because he liked his shot of whiskey before he went to bed. <laughs> so from there, I w secretly went to my great grandmother. The one who was native that I'm not supposed to know she was native, and started asking her questions. I have cousins down on the Pine Ridge Reservation I have never met. One day, if not on this plane, on the next, but you know, life is good. I have no more. Are you from Germany? Where you grew up? No, I grew up in Madisonville, but my grandmother lived here in Germany, and my aunt Jane Haley lives. How are we doing? Okay. Somewhere. Somewhere past Germany.